more than 2,000 years, uh, Jews have been living in the city of Rome, considering themselves the people of the book. Uh, and as such, they have been, since they've been in Rome for more than 2,000 years, they constitute what I think is the longest surviving Jewish community in the Western world. Um, so this is the presentation. Uh, this is an, uh, a quote from an anonymous librarian of the Shlolem Aleichem Library in Radomsko, Poland, which serves as the epigraph for the essay. From days of memorial, books played an important, even vital role uh, in our nation's life. Rightly, we were considered in the, in the diaspora the people of the book when the book served as a loyal companion of our nation. When I first started this research, I had assumed that the books of the Roman ghetto had ended up like all of those Nazi bonfires that we are so familiar with. And I had thought of this line from uh, John Milton from 1644, as good almost kill a man, as good as kill a good book. He who kills a man kills a reasonable creature, God's image. But he who destroys a book kills reason itself. Or I had thought of Heinrich Heine's famous quote, wherever they burn books, there they will also in the end burn human beings. For those of us who are still caught in the 20th century, you may have come to mind uh, Ray Bradbury's famous book, Fahrenheit 451, and what that meant for the 20th century. Um, so we have in the 20th century, these indelible I images of these Nazi bonfires consuming with the twin scourges of fire and hatred, the intellectual patrimony of an entire civilization. The Nazis were intent on wiping out this whole tradition from decadent liberals to disease, quote unquote, diseased Jews to the traitorous Thomas Mann. And so other historical precedents that I thought of were the burning of the library at Alexandria, the sack of Rome by the Vandals, Savonarola's bonfire of the vanities um, in the Renaissance, in Renaissance Florence, and also Umberto Eco's famous fictional account of a, uh, a library burning in a medieval monastery in Northern Italy. In another work, Eco had once written, a library is the best possible imitation by human beings of a divine mind where the whole universe is viewed and understood at the same time. A person able to store in their mind the information provided by a great library would emulate in some way the mind of God. In the winter of 1939, Jewish scholars were already aware of what the Nazi war would mean, at least as far as Jewish material culture was concerned. An article had appeared in the Deutsche Allgemeine Zeitung entitled Books, 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 and he quoted Kaim Aaron Kaplan from his diary in which he said, we are dealing with a nation of high culture, with a people of the book. The Germans have simply gone crazy for one thing, books. Germany has become a madhouse for books. Say what you will, I fear such people. Where plunder is based on an ideology, on a world act outlook which is in essence spiritual, it cannot be equaled in strength and durability. The Nazi has robbed us not only of our material possessions, but also of our good name as the people of the book. In the northern Italian city of Torino, a city with a Jewish population of little more than 4,000 in 1938, Jewish books were burned, but not by Nazis. They were burned by Italian fascists. Before the Nazis had ever set foot in occupied Italy, the Turinese fascists forced their way into the Jewish community library, seized much of the collection, and used the books to feed an enormous bonfire, uh, I apologize for the poor quality of the image, of the, in the Piazza Carlina in Torino. Uh, 
Yet the story of the books of the Roman ghetto reveals instead that the two libraries, that of the synagogue and the library of the rabbinical college, that were not burned. Another fate awaited those libraries. Their story is part of the crime against Rome's Jewish community that began with the Nazi occupation of Rome in July of 1943, just hours after King Victor Emmanuel III had removed Mussolini from power. The fascist regime had come to power more than two decades earlier in October of 1922 without any trace of official anti-Semitism. Indeed, Italian Jews, as part of the Italian bourgeoisie, supported the regime and were present in the highest levels of the fascist hierarchy. Guido Young as finance minister, Aldo Finzi as undersecretary of the Ministry of the Interior. It was not until 1934 that the anti-Semites within fascism were unleashed. In 1938, the regime passed extensive anti-Semitic legislation based on the Nuremberg laws of Nazi Germany. Um, to their credit, most of the Italians decided to circumvent or ignore those laws. In fact, until the Nazi occupation of Italy, not one Italian Jew was transported to the death camps, even though the Nazi leadership had been insistent on this point. In September of 1943, the SS commander in charge of Rome, Captain Herbert Kepler, summoned the leaders of the Jewish community into his office on Biatasso in Rome. He demanded a ransom of 50 kilos of gold to be paid within 36 hours in exchange for the safety of the Jewish community. On the international gold market in 1943, 50 kilos of gold were worth approximately $56,000. With 12,000 Jews in Rome, a ransom of $4.50 per person seems like a small price to pay for the life of a human being. At his trial after the war, Kepler defended his decision as preferable to deportations. What he did not reveal was that the order for the deportation of Rome's Jews had already been sent and that his supposedly humanitarian gesture was merely an act of extor extortion. Within hours, word of the extortion demand had spread beyond the ghetto. Jews and Gentiles alike presented themselves at the synagogue to contribute whatever they could. The receipts, the receipts that were issued revealed that most contributions were pathetically small, a ring, a bracelet, an earring. Yet the 50 kilos were collected and deposited at the SS office in Via Tasso. The community breathed a sigh of collective relief, confident that the atrocities that were rumored to have taken place on the Eastern Front and the reports of death camps must be exaggerations. In addition, it was inconceivable that here in the eternal city, the Pope would allow, quote unquote, his Jews to be subject to deportation. The few who quietly suggested that the Germans would not be content with only the gold were ignored. On the morning after the payment of the gold ransom, the eve of Rosh Hashanah, as it, as it turned out, officers from Kepler's office knocked on the door of Ugo, Ugo Foa, who was the president of the Jewish community. The Germans quickly assured Fawa that they were not there to arrest him. Instead, they had orders to search the premises of the synagogue. Rumor had it that the synagogue was harboring anti-fascists and collaborating with the enemy. The Germans were thorough in, the in their search. They broke up the, the arms boxes, entered the oratio for the Spanish rites, and destroyed the ark, throwing the two sacred Torahs inside to the ground. More importantly, they carried away thousands of records and documents, including the names and addresses of virtually every Jew in the city of Rome. The next day, September 30th, 1943, the first day of the Jewish New Year, two representatives from the Einstadtstabs Reichsleiter Rosenberg, the ERR, appeared at the synagogue. The ERR was a special commando unit established in 1940 by the official theoretician of National Socialism, Alfred Rosenberg, and was an integral part of, of the German and Nazi. This is a uh, film poster of the film that was made about the gold extortion in Rome. My apologies. 
This is Alfred Rosenberg and some of the staff of the ERR. This office was established in two formal divisions, regional organizations called work groups and special staffs whose responsibility included the fields of art and historical. A historian of the ERR has called it a quote, commando organization of cultural robbery. Its chief function was to confiscate, plunder, and loot objects of art during the war and may have been the philosopher's most successful endeavor. Rosenberg already had years of experience in the field of quote unquote cultural policy. In August of 1927, at the first of the great Nuremberg rallies, the National Social Society for Culture and Learning was established. Two months later, Rosenberg was appointed its director. Uh, in 1929, that association was renamed the Combat League for German Culture and was Rosenberg's attempt to insinuate himself into the Nazi organizational and bureaucratic hierarchy. As such, he often came into conflict with Joseph Goebbels and the Ministry for Propaganda and Popular Enlightenment. Other less quote-unquote enlightened Nazis could not see any reason for preserving any remnant of Jewish culture. Most were probably of the same mind as the Nazi correspondent who reported on the destruction of the library of the yeshiva in Lub Lublin. I thought I had an image of that, but not, sorry. For us, it was a matter of special pride to destroy the Talmudic Academy in Lublin, which was known as the greatest in Poland. We threw the huge library out of the building and carried the books to the marketplace where we set fire to them. The fire lasted for 20 hours. The Jews assembled around and wept bitterly, almost silencing us with their cries. We summoned the military band and with joyful shouts, the soldiers drowned out the sounds of the Jews crying. The ERR devised an efficient and highly coordinated organization for the plunder art from museums, and books, documents, and manuscripts from libraries, schools, universities, and private citizens. It was placed in the Wehrmacht by an official act of Hitler and had its headquarters in Berlin, which branched offices in all of occupied Europe. And these were divided into subgroups and uh, localized centers. If a desired object belonged to foreign quote unquote Aryans, the owners were compelled to sell it if it belonged to Jews, it was simply confiscated. The property of Jews who had fled the Nazi onslaught was declared ownerless, and therefore the ERR had the quote-unquote obligation to store it in a safe place within the Reich. Rosenberg seems to have been particularly interested in libraries for a pet project of his, a institute uh, for the Nazi party for the advanced academic study of Jewish life and culture. Uh, and this institute was supposed to be created in Frankfurt. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit. Uh, this is because in Frankfurt, there had already been a library of Judaica that had been given by the Rothschilds family. And after having confiscated that library, the Nazis would create this institute for the study of the Jewish question and uh, with all of their confiscated uh, books and manuscripts, they were going to bring everything to Frankfurt. The Institute uh, was supposed to be critical in teaching, quote, the, the spiritual basis and tactics of our ideological adversary, end quote. Jewish scholars from the liquidated ghetto at Vilna were employed at the Frankfurt Center, which mm -hmm. eventually collected in a kind of perverse twist of irony over six million works. At the Roman synagogue that September day in 1943, approximately 20 officials searched the premises paying particular attention, according to the diary of an office worker, to the two libraries, the Biblioteca Comunale and the Biblioteca del Collegio Rabinico, the communal library and the library of the rabbinical college. The libraries of the Roman ghetto, like those of other ghettos in Europe, were centers for both the spiritual and secular life of the community. The next day, October 1st, two men from the ERR returned to the synagogue 
and introduced themselves to Hugo Foa as Orientalists. Mm -hmm. One in the dress of a captain of the SS and identified as a specialist in Hebrew from Berlin, asked permission to examine the community's libraries. The American historian has given a very vivid description of the library. Quote, the Biblioteca Comunale had a magnificent collection, one of the richest in Europe, not only for the study of Judaica, but also for early Christianity. A heritage of 2,000 years of Jewish presence in Rome, the library contained vast treasures that had not yet been cataloged. Among the known material were the only copies of books and manuscripts dating back to before the birth of Christ, from the time of the Caesars, the emperors, and the early popes. There were engravings from the Middle Ages, books from the earliest printers, and papers and documents handed down through the ages." End quote. Beginning 2,000 years ago, the Jewish community of Rome had accumulated these materials with significant additions during the medieval period. The collection was substantially enlarged in 1492 with the influx, influx of Jews expelled from Spain and Sicily. By the 20th century, the collections in both libraries were still being cataloged according to the date of acquisition, thereby making research rather difficult. The Jews of Rome, found themselves caught between the benevolence and betrayal of their city. There was the humiliation of being ordered to march on the, tri the, the triumphal arch of Titus, which depicted the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, kissing the ground where the Pope's foot had been, and forced to listen to sermons demanding their conversion to Christianity. In 1322, on orders of Pope John XXII, copies of the Talmud were destroyed in Rome, and this was neither the first nor the last time that such an event had occurred uh, in the shadow of the papacy. The golden age of the Hebrew book in Italy was the 16th century, when, notwithstanding the censorship of papal and civil authorities, Hebrew publishers crafted beautiful and influential texts. Um, Rome was the center of this trade with many Jewish scholars and printers uh, working. Uh, I won't go through the names of all of them, but Rome, as well as other Renaissance cities like Florence and Venice, and even smaller cities like Ravenna and Mantova, uh, became centers of not only Italian Jewish publishing, but uh, Jewish publishing throughout uh, Europe. Um, Unfortunately, as you know, in 1556, uh, it was Pope Paul III who had decreed the establishment of the ghetto in Rome. Uh, a few years previous, in 1560, the Republic of Venice had established actually the first ghetto in Europe. The Counter-Reformation and the workings of the Roman Inquisition effectively blocked publication of new works in Hebrew, and it was not until 1810 that another Hebrew, a book in Hebrew was published in Rome. So between 1556 and 1810, there were no books in Hebrew published in Rome. Uh, but it was none other than Pier Luigi Farnese, the illegitimate son of Pope Paul III, the Pope who had initiated the ghetto, who had petitioned his father for the privilege of establishing a Hebrew press in Rome. Uh, uh, it was a request that his father, the Pope, denied. The 16th and 17th centuries witnessed more bonfires of Hebrew books in, including several in the Piazza of St. Peter's itself. The rationalism of the Enlightenment put an end to this practice. Now books were merely confiscated rather than burned. In April of 1753, papal authorities entered the ghetto after the gates had been closed for the night and proceeded to fill 38 carts with about 650 books that disappeared into the Vatican Library. In 1893, the books of one synagogue were destroyed by fire. As spurred by this catastrophe, the community began to act to preserve a priceless legacy. Uh, and that's when the uh, period began of trying to catalog and preserve these books and manuscripts. In Rome, there was not one synagogue. Until 1905, there were actually five schools or school or schools in Rome. Uh, devoted to the various rites, the German rite, the Sephardic rite, the Spanish rite, the Italian rite. Uh, and these were combined in 1904 with the consecration of the synagogue, which now exists there in Rome. 
1934, Jewish scholar Isaiah Song had spent eight days examining the contents of the Jewish libraries in Rome. He had divided his labors between five groups of texts. There were the ancient manuscripts, the Incunabola, the works of the famous Soncino Publishing House, um, Oriental texts from the 16th century, mostly from Constantinople and Salonika in Greece, and miscellaneous works that fit into no particular category. The manuscripts were from the 14th through the 19th centuries and represented monuments of the literary intellectual life of Rome. They revealed Jewish participation in the Spanish philosophical movement of the 1400s, as well as the spiritual crisis of the 16th century in which the Kabbalah came to replace philosophy for some. Also included were the works of the rabbi and medical doctor Moses Riete, manuscripts spirited out of Spain and Sicily during the Jewish expulsion of 1492, uh, Portuguese texts, mathematical texts that had come from the Near East, uh, and a very important Hebrew, Italian, Arabic uh, dictionary that had been published in Naples in 1488. There were 21 Talmudic tracts published by the famous Soncino Publishing House, uh, which had been prohibited by uh, circulation by Pope Julius II, and also an eight volume edition of the Talmud by the famous 16th century Venetian printer, Daniel Bomberg. Here is the ghetto, a map of the ghetto and the synagogue as well. The ERR officers informed Ugo Fawa that in the interest of their studies, the catalogs of the libraries were to be handed over to them. A few days later, another officer, this time a lieutenant who claimed to be a paleographer and a specialist trained in Semitic philology, examined the libraries. As his men rifled through the libraries, an eyewitness noticed the Nazi intellectual. And here are some other images from the 16th century publishers in Rome and in Venice. The officer, with artful and meticulous hands like fine embroidery, softly touched, caressed, fondled the papyrus and incunabula. He turned the pages of manuscripts and rare editions and leafed through the, the codices and palimpsests. The varying attentions of his touch, the differing artfulness of his gestures were at once proportionate to the volume's worth. Those works, for the most part, were written in obscure alphabets, but in opening their pages, the officer's eyes would fix on them, widening and brightening in the same way that some readers who are particularly familiar with the subject know where to find the desired part, the revealing passage. In those elegant hands, as if under keen and bloodless torture, a kind of very subtle sadism, the ancient books had spoken. In the presence of the synagogue's secretary, Rosina Sorani, whose diary is today preserved at the Yivo Institute in New York, the officer telephoned an international shipping company and made arrangements for the books to be transported out of Rome. Here is Rosina Sorani's uh, entry in her diary from October 11, 1943. They turned to me and told me that they had seen very well how many books there were in the libraries and in what order. They declared that the libraries were under sequester, that within a few days they would come back to get the books and that all was to be left as it was. If not, I would have to pay with my life. Rosina Sorani informed Ugo Fawa, who contacted Dante Almanzi, who was at, then, at, the, at that time the Union of Jewish Communities. Together, they drafted a letter and sent four copies to various offices within the fascist regime. The Library Division of the Ministry of Education, the Directorate of General of, of Religions, the Director General of Public Security, and the Director General of Civil Administration. Perhaps they should not have been surprised that no fascist official offered to intercede, especially since the last three officers were under the direct direction of a notorious war criminal and rabid anti-Semite, Guido Buffarino Guido, who was at that very moment preparing anti-Semitic legislation far more severe than had been passed by the regime in 1938. On the morning of October 13th, two full-size freight cars from the German National Railroad, which had been placed on Rome's trolley lines, pulled up in front of the synagogue by the Tiber River. Fawa and Almansi were by now frantic. 
concerned about the priceless gold and silver religious articles, they hit upon an ingenious solution. The mikvah baths were emptied of the water and an artisan began the laborious process of hiding the religious articles within the walls of the baths. Some of the most important works found refuge in a nearby municipal library, the Biblioteca Balicelliana. At precisely 8.30 a.m. the next day, the 14th of October, which was the first day of the festival of Sukkah, officials of the ERR returned with workers from the transport company. They spent the entire day collecting the contents of the two libraries, putting them onto the railroad cards. And as they were emptying both libraries, the artisan involved in the mikvah deception arrived unnoticed by the Germans and proceeded to complete his work, thereby saving most of the most precious religious articles of the synagogue. Later, pieces were hidden in gardens and homes all over Rome. After the first two railroad cards had been loaded to capacity, they departed. Witnesses noticed that they had come from Munich. Two months later, on December 22nd, the Germans returned to carry away the last remaining books and manuscripts from the rabbinical college. Perhaps they took special pleasure in the fact that it was the first day of Hanukkah. In all, the Nazis confiscated some 10,000 volumes from the Jewish community of Rome. For the next several days, the Jews of Rome debated amongst themselves the significance of this latest development. Some insisted that this was the beginning of even greater persecution. Others noted that a crime against books was not a crime against people. Pe panic began to seep into the community. A foreign journalist noted at the time that, quote, the population is half crazy. Young men and families look desperately for hiding places. They get them. Then they look for better ones. Convents and seminaries have become the most sought after hideouts. Another famous one is the lunatic asylum. Scores of people have entered and filled it to the bursting point. Rome never had so many madmen, end quote. But the fate of the Jews of Rome was much more severe than that in store for the precious books. After the war, some of the books were to be returned from Frankfurt after delicate diplomatic negotiations. Most of Rome's Jews who were deported were not to return to the Eternal City. By the fall of 1943, much of the diplomatic corps, military officers, and the Vatican, including the Pope, Pius XII, were aware that the Germans were preparing to deport the Jews. The German consul in Rome, Mulhausen, had sent a telegram to Foreign Minister von Ribbentrop on the 6th of October, marked very, very urgent, in which he repeated that SS Captain Kapler, quote, had received orders from Berlin to seize the 8,000 Jews resident in Rome and transport them north to where they are to be liquidated. End quote. As far as I know, this is the only Nazi document that makes a direct reference to liquidating the Jews, rather than the more traditional used phrase uh, of special handling. In fact, it was only two days after the confiscation of the libraries that the deportations of the Jews of Rome began. In the early morning hours of the Sabbath, the 16th of October, 1943, Kepler's men carried out a highly organized search of the ghetto and seized over 1,000 Jews. They were held over the weekend at the Collegio Militare, a mere 100 yards from the Pope's residence in the Vatican. Pius XII decided not to intervene on behalf of, quote unquote, his Jews. During the night, Marcella di Tivoli Perugia, captured with her two children, gave birth in the courtyard after the Germans refused her release to the hospital. On Monday morning, the Jews were herded into railroad cars and began their nightmare journey to Auschwitz. The Germans extended far more consideration for the safety of the books than for the Jews. Of the 1,041 Jews deported from Rome that day, only 15 returned to Rome after the war. The books, though, had a different fate. With the Allied bombings of Frankfurt, the vast holdings of the ERR in the Institute for the Study of the Jewish Question were moved to repositories in the small village of Hungen. After the war, the Rothschild Library in Frankfurt served to house the vast collections. In October of 1945, 
a young officer in the Monuments, Fine Arts, and Archives section of the Allied military government was assigned to make a survey of the collections in order to expedite restitution and recommended that operations be moved to the larger, larger quarters in the city of Offenbach. Ironically located in the abandoned IG Farben plant, the United States Archival Depot under the direction of Major Simon Pomerantz, who was a former archivist at the National Archives, eventually proceeded in processing millions of books. Uh, some of these uh, books from the Collegio Rabbinico of Rome were returned in March of 1947 uh, with the assistance of an Italian officer. Uh, there are other statistics that I won't go into, uh, including some very important documents that were returned after the war. Uh, but let me, let me go to my conclusion. This way we can spend more time uh, speaking amongst ourselves and asking some questions. So what might we conclude from this brief study of a small episode buried within the immensity of the Holocaust? One of the things that I tried to do both with this essay and with the book on the Nazi graffiti was in a, in a historical event of such enormous uh, uh, atrocity, I thought that maybe by focusing on a small facet of that atrocity, we might be able to understand it a little better. The true student and scholar must be prepared to abandon previously held conceptions. I had begun the study assuming that the books of the Roman ghetto had merely been sacrificed in a burnt offering to racial hatred, a Holocaust with a lower cage H uh, enveloped in the Holocaust with a capital H. But the real fate of the books to pr prove to be in many ways, in some ways, even more disturbing. Pseudoscience and corrupted scholarship at the service of a deviant and diabolical ideology. Here is but one small yet bitterly ironic example of the immense perversity of the Nazi project. A people whose entire existence was bound and symbolized in the book were systematically destroyed while their precious works were given lavish and even loving attention from the very people who sought their destruction. A couple of more images here on the left, you see uh, members of the ERR going through books. On the right, you see the depot in Offenbach. This is a photograph by the United States Army in October of 1945. Uh, here is the stamp that the Institute of uh, uh, the Reichsleiter Rosenberg had imprinted on their confiscated materials. You see the, uh, the image on the book on the right. Um, the next, oh, I, I have to preface something. Then I debated among, uh, with myself whether to show you the next slide. As I was doing an internet search of this image, of this stamp, this came up. Some of you might be familiar with the middle image here, which is the the symbolic medallion of the Israeli intelligence services, the Mossad. In some, on some conspiracy alt-right and neo-Nazi websites, this is the image that appears when they speak about the Mossad. Do you see this? That they have simply taken the German or the Nazi eagle and they have plastered it, they have imposed it on the medallion of the Mossad which I almost fell off my chair when I saw this for the first time. A uh, couple of books that mention the, uh, the seizure of the libraries, Robert Katz's uh, controversial book, Black Sabbath, and a more recent book by Giacomo de Benedetti, who worked with Primo Levi after the war to write about Auschwitz. Uh, this has an essay by Estelle Gilson about the uh, libraries in Rome. Uh, and uh, two more recent books, The Book Thieves and Stolen Work, The Nazi Plunder of Jewish Books by Mark Lichtman, uh, and a couple of uh, bibliographical references. So uh, that's the formal presentation, but I'm uh, much more interested in comments and uh, observations from all of you. So how would you like to proceed? Dan, why don't you uh, either 
people can raise their hand and ask a question you can call on them or they can put it into the chat and you can read it from there or I can read the question to you. Yeah, I can read off the chat. If they raise their hand, will I be able to see them? I'll be able to call on them? I believe yes. Okay. So, Let's give it a try. Okay. So any questions? Uh, Just out of curiosity, how many uh, had known something about this story, if not the, the particular story of the libraries in Rome about how this particular unit of the SS had been charged? I'm, I'm assuming many of you know about the Monuments Men and how uh, that unit of the American Army had been charged with recuperating stolen artwork. Uh, there have been several films, including that one with George Clooney and uh, the, wo the, the Woman in Gold about the stolen uh, Gustav Klimt uh, uh, painting that was eventually returned to a Jewish family from which it had been uh, stolen. But the libraries in Rome, for I'm not sure why, had not been a very well known even to people who had uh, studied the Holocaust. Uh, any questions? I'm looking at the chat. Where can the uh, so where can the artifacts that were hidden in the mikvah be seen? So uh, this is uh, Bob, is this Bob Chapman? The artifacts uh, were uh, successfully hidden from the Nazis. They were uh, returned from the various places that they've been scattered throughout Rome. And if today you go to the synagogue uh, on, along the side of the Tiber River. Uh, you can see them displayed uh, in the museum. Most of the artifacts uh, were not confiscated, whereas most of the books were. And according to different scholars, uh, some of them have been returned. Most of them have not been returned. Uh, there is now a, an online archive in Germany uh, attempting to try to figure out where some of these uh, manuscripts and book are, books are to try to restore them to their proper uh, uh, venues. Uh, what do you believe the Nazis plan to do with the books? Well, I don't know if you missed this, Angela, but uh, the idea was not to uh, destroy the books, not to send them to bonfires, but to uh, house them, archive them at the Institute in Frankfurt, the Institute for the Study of the Jewish Question, uh, which is a kind of really deviant and almost perverse uh, project that in order to uh, ultimately destroy our enemies, we have to first understand them. So we're going to confiscate as much of the material culture as possible, especially books uh, and uh, manuscripts. Um, um, so uh, another question from Jill, where did the Nazis keep the books? As I mentioned, they had them in Frankfurt. Uh, they had been moved several times because Frankfurt was uh, being bombed by the Allies. When the Allies finally arrived uh, in Germany in April and May of 1945, some of them were still in Frankfurt. Some of them were at the depot in Offenbach. Uh, Greta Krauss, do you know if the books are a part of the Jews and still get burned, destroyed, or taken away from people who are Jews today? Anyway, I just don't do you know what people have done. To ah, I, this I don't know. Uh, Greta Kraus, does everybody see this question? If uh, Jewish books are still being uh, burned or destroyed in other parts of the world, uh, do we know if that happens in places maybe where ISIS uh, still has power? Anyone want to respond to that? You have to unmute yourself. Um, Yeah, and I think they are being destroyed in some of the countries by ISIS, as you said. Yeah. And where there's anti-Semitism. And not just books, other things as well, important things to the religion. So there is a similar story about the books in the Vilnius ghetto, right, in the various ghettos of uh, Central Europe uh, that were hidden by Jews. And, and there's also kind of perversity where Jewish scholars and archivists were first forced to work for the Nazis in actual cataloging and uh, uh, storage of these books and uh, manuscripts. So, uh, 
Casey responds that yes, in Iran and Egypt and some Arab Muslim countries, Jewish texts and books are being destroyed. So that doesn't surprise me. Uh, uh, another part of this controversy, which I still haven't been able to clear up, is that uh, it's suspected that some of these books and manuscripts uh, ended up in the Vatican Library, uh, whether it was for safekeeping or for less uh, noble reasons, we don't know. Uh, we do know that some of those books and manuscripts were returned from the Vatican Library to the Jewish community. Uh, it's part of a very complicated history between the Vatican and the Jewish community of Rome during the fascist period and especially during the Nazi occupation of Rome. Just to give you a very small piece of this, the chief rabbi of Rome, when the Nazis uh, occupied the city in the fall of 1943, disappeared. Uh, he did not reappear until the Allies sh showed up in June of 1944, at which point he reappeared. And when the Jews of Rome asked the rabbi, the chief rabbi, where were you, where were you in our moment of uh, tribulation? He revealed that he had been offered hiding in the Vatican Library. Uh, but to add insult to injury, after the Second World War, the chief rabbi of Rome actually converted to Catholicism. <laughs> So that's another one of these crazy twists of this story. Uh, Christopher Hailing writes, how much support did the Nazi ERR units receive from Italian fascists? Did they actively help or did they simply not participate due to the confusion after the capitulation of Italy? Uh, I have just uh, uh, written a review that has appeared in the American Historical Review. This is a work of um, uh, revisionist history, revisionist in the best sense, which challenged the traditional historiography that the Italians uh, were not collaborators and did not lend assistance to the Nazis in the occupation of Italy and the occupation of Rome. As it turns out, we now know, we've known this for several decades, that the Italian fascists collaborated very closely uh, with the Nazis, especially in things like the roundup of the Jews in Rome and Milan and other places. As far as the confiscation of uh, material goods and the libraries, for whatever reason, the Italian fascists were not very concerned with this, perhaps because they were not going to receive the spoils uh, of the libraries. The, they knew that the libraries were headed for Frankfurt, for Germany. Uh, the Italian fascists were very eager to help themselves to material spoils like uh, property, uh, jewelry, uh, artwork, and things like that. But uh, as far as the libraries and the manuscripts were concerned, it doesn't seem that the Italian fascists officially were part of that. Um, so, um, devoted to Dead Red, but it was supposed to be in Prague. Uh, not in Prague, but in Frankfurt, as I mentioned, the Institute for the Study of the Jewish Question. Uh, Casey writes that the papacy has a huge store of stolen books and artifacts going to the beginning of the papacy. Uh, their grandfather saw this in 1924, where the Jews were allowed to see some of the stolen, stolen Jewish property. Yeah, um, yes. Um, I don't know anything more about Samuel Blinder, uh, um, but uh, I know that there is work on him online and you can probably find that, Alan. Um, you just look him up. He is mentioned in several articles, scholarly articles that are available online. Um, um, other questions, comments, criticisms? You're all too polite. Uh, where is some of the really early works? Uh, I have to tell you that the half dozen times that I've been back to Rome and the synagogue and the rabbinical college, uh, I have to tell you that uh, Jewish archivists in Italy share the same defect as their Gentile colleagues, which is that unlike in America and Britain, which I have to say is like a paradise for scholars uh, in Italy, and in, I think this is also true in France, Archivists don't see it as their job to make your research easier. They see themselves as guardian at the gates, uh, preventing the profane, like people like me, from entering the sacred paradise. And it's very difficult to uh, 
get in. It's even difficult to have emails returned as to like, what is the current status? Uh, are these works cataloged? Uh, how much of the libraries have been returned? Uh, it's almost very, uh, it's, it's quite difficult to get uh, answers to these uh, uh, questions, you know. Unless you have an inside, uh, which I don't have, uh, it's very hard to get some of these questions. And that's why some of the contemporary scholarship is actually contradictory. So some scholars say none of the books were returned. Some scholars say some of the books were returned. I've actually seen some of the books uh, with that stamp of the ERR in Rome. So I know some of them were returned. But as I've mentioned informally, uh, even though some of those uh, books and manuscripts have been returned, they now are indelibly stamped with that image of hatred that, you know, that Nazi eagle, uh, it's not the swastika, it's the Nazi eagle and, you know, the Institute uh, for the Jewish Question. Uh, so unfortunately, even though some of those uh, books and manuscripts have been returned, they are indelibly marked by that, uh, that stamp of the ERR. I have to say that this venue of Zoom is not exactly ideal. I much prefer being in my second home, which is the Hofstra Center Cultural Theater. Would have been much better to be there with hands going up and a conversation taking place. Um, uh, or have, uh, this is a very interesting question from Crystal Haling. Uh, the repatriated works that have the logo stamped on them uh, have they been tempted to be uh, removed? Uh, I, I don't know if that has been discussed among archivists. In some ways, it is, that question is similar to the debate that we're having right now in the United States about the removal of certain statues, whether of Confederate generals or in my own little world of Christopher Columbus. Uh, uh, I'll give you a very, very quick, brief example of this. About 10 years ago, people in Chicago had contacted me asking for my support to rename a street in Chicago, Balbo Drive. Italo Balbo was the Charles Lindbergh of fascism. He had flown a squadron of planes to America, to Chicago in 1933, and was received as a hero, ticker tape parade, the whole nine yards, and the city of Chicago named the street Balbo Drive. And the question was, uh, we want to get rid of this name because it was an infamous fascist. And I am, I am of, of mixed feelings about this because we could change the name of the street, uh, but in one way that would erase the history of the, the shameful history of Italian Americans who by and large supported fascism in the 1920s and 30s. So the same kind of thinking is going on with statues of Christopher Columbus, Although for the record, I'm completely on board with removing statues of like Robert E. Lee or Stonewall Jackson. That's a whole nother story. Okay. So, so uh, what about the prosecution of Italian fascists post-war? So a friend of mine, Roy Domenico, wrote a book uh, about 20 years ago, Italian Fascists on Trial, in which he discovered that other than a handful of people who were summarily executed by the partisans, including Mussolini himself with his mistress, 95% uh, of Italian fascists uh, were not tried. They were not prosecuted after the war. And in fact, ironically, it was Palmiro Togliatti, the leader of the Italian Communist Party, who had specified, who had agreed to a kind of amnesty for high-level fascist hierarchy, with the idea being that Italy had to uh, move forward and we could not rehash the past. Something similar happened in France, it happened in many other countries, it happened in Germany. Uh, and so for the most part, Italian fascists were not uh, prosecuted after war. By the way, one character in our story, I have to tell you, uh, Herbert Kepler, uh, who was the SS captain in Rome, was captured by the British in uh, the summer of 1945, in the spring of 1945, he was imprisoned. Uh, he was imprisoned actually for a civilian massacre that took place uh, in uh, March of 1944, when Italian partisans ambushed a German battalion, killing 33 soldiers. Hitler insisted on a, uh, a reprisal of 10 Italians for every German killed. 
So the next day, March 24th, 1944, uh, 1943, I'm sorry, 335 men and boys, some as young as 14 years old, were executed in the caves outside of Rome. Herbert Kepler was responsible for that massacre. He was arrested by the British. Uh, on the day he was to be brought to trial, the British MPs went to collect him in prison and he had disappeared. He had disappeared. Uh, uh, and eventually he was caught, put on trial, and another figure, uh, he was put on trial, he was convicted, he was in prison, and in 1966, he escaped from prison uh, and was returned to West Germany, which refused to expedite him, and he died a free man in his own home in 1972. Another person who was involved in that massacre, Eric Pripka, actually fled to Argentina, where he was tracked down by an American journalist in 1995, put on trial, acquitted by a military tribunal, retried, convicted by a civilian court, and sentenced to house arrest, and died only a few years ago at the age of 100. So while a few Nazi officers had been put on trial, almost no fascist officials of the hierarchy had been uh, prosecuted after the Second World War. Um, who were the Italian military who were killed in concentration camps? Uh, yes, there were, after, after Mussolini was deposed, the Italian military had to make a decision. Would they fight on the side of Nazi Germany? Uh, would they fight on the side of the Allies? Or would they, as many of them did, simply take off their uniforms, put themselves in civilian clothes and go home? Those Italian military officers who decided to join the Allies sometimes were captured by the Germans and sent to concentration camps where they fared no better than Russian POWs who had a tremendously high uh, death rate in the concentration camps. A lot of Nazis fled to Argentina. Yes, uh, Jill, I was just mentioning the story of Eric Pripka. When he was put on trial in 1995 and asked, how did you manage to escape from Rome? He said in open court, that he had received assistance from the Vatican to escape from Rome to Argentina, thereby confirming the rumors of the so-called rat line, which had spirited Nazi and fascist war criminals out of Europe to South America. So Eric Pripka himself confirmed the existence of the rat line and the assistance of the Vatican. And yes, uh, the Nazi scientists, especially Werner Braun, who was uh, instrumental in developing the United States uh, space program, the rocket program uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, final questions, comments? Uh, I heard that moment. Uh, yes, uh, Bob, uh, Bob is asking a question to me privately. The, there is a new commission uh, of the Vatican uh, with historians and scholars and archivists to try to figure out how to release. This is under uh, Pope John Paul, uh, Pope Francis the uh, I, to release more Vatican do documents, especially those pertaining to the Second World War. You should know that after the Second World War, the Vatican re released 12 volumes of documents pertaining to the Second World War. But of course, as most historians realize right away, that was only a drop in a vast ocean of documents. So they're working on that now and trying to figure out which documents uh, to be released. This had already been uh, tried about 20 years ago, a commission of British, Israeli, American, and I think French uh, historians and scholars were working with the Vatican and that commission dissolved in acrimony because of tension between the scholars and the Vatican. So nothing came of that 20 years ago. Here we are two decades later, we're still trying to get our hands on the same documents. Maybe with Francis, uh, historians and scholars might have a little bit uh, better luck. Uh, uh, unrelated question, no, not unrelated, if any Italian fascists were brought to the United States. Um, uh, I don't know if uh, Italian fascists were brought here. I do know that many Italian fascists uh, had a miraculous transformation. 
into more quote unquote reputable political ideologies, whether it be Christian democracy or even more left wing ideologies. Um, but as Roy Domenico points out in his book, as happened in France, uh, it was simply impossible to have a purge of all of the people who had collaborated in the bureaucracy, in the hierarchy, in the administration, in the civil service, in the military. Uh, the argument was made that, uh, that the country simply bureaucratically, administratively would simply fall apart if you purged everyone who had some kind of uh, collaboration with the fascist regime. Um, uh, so, yes, uh, Carol, it, all you have to do, uh, Book Thieves, if, if you saw the, one of the screens, uh, Book Thieves and uh, Stolen Words are the two most recent books by American scholars. There are a lot of uh, academic and scholarly articles that you can find online as well. Uh, the one book that really brought this to the attention of the public was Robert Katz, who was an American historian who spent uh, the entire period after the Second World War in Rome, uh, who managed to get his hands on some of the documents and actually interview some of the protagonists. Uh, Black Sabbath, uh, which was a very controversial book because he laid out the very intricate uh, relationship and the collaboration between the Italian fascists and the German Nazis, as well as what the Vatican did or did not do during the Nazi occupation of Rome. Uh, what happened to Jewish Italian fascists? Very interesting. If you remember the two that I had put on the slide early on, Aldo Jung and uh, uh, Guido Jung and Aldo Finci. Aldo Finci, who was the undersecretary for the Ministry of the Interior, uh, very high position. It's sort of like uh, the Ministry of the Interior in European countries is sort of like the FBI. It deals with the internal domestic police. Uh, Aldo Finci was made to be the fall guy for a political assassination of an Italian socialist member of parliament in 1924. He was forced from uh, the regime. He returned to private life in Rome. In 1944, 20 years later, he decided to join the resistance, the anti-fascist resistance. He was captured by the Gestapo in Rome, uh, tortured and killed by the Germans in 1944. An incredible story, a kind of microcosm of the history of Italian Jews in the Second World War because most of them had begun in 1922 supporting Italian fascism because Italian fascism, unlike Nazism, did not begin with an anti-Semitic philosophy. Many Italian Jews gravitated towards fascism. Uh, it is also known that Mussolini had a Jewish mistress at the time, Margarita Sarfati, but as uh, uh, Hitler came to power in Germany and as fascist Italy and Nazi Germany had increasingly closer ties, including the access, the Rome-Berlin access. Uh, Mussolini began to imitate the Germans more. There's a whole historiographical debate to what extent was Italian fascism simply mimicking Nazi Germany or whether uh, uh, fascist anti-Semitism was done solely by the fascists. As it turns out, uh, Italian Jews were caught in this kind of predicament, probably best represented by uh, Vittorio De Sica's famous film that won the Oscar in 1972, The Garden of the Finci Contini, which some of you probably remember. Italian Jews just simply could not get their head around that they would eventually suffer the same fate as Jews in France and in Central Europe. They thought that being in Italy for 2,000 years offered them some kind of protection, especially the Jews of Rome, who felt and we can see this in their private correspondence, that because they were in Rome, that the Pope would never allow them to be deported. As it turned out, although the Pope knew they were going to be deported, he knew for three days they were going to be deported, he never spoke out publicly or privately. Okay. Uh, Lisa writes that one of her great uncles was drafted to serve for the Italian army, was the father of American children, not allowed back here until 1954. Wow. Uh, is that be oh, because he served for a foreign enemy uh, army? Although uh, in September, September 8th, 1943, Italy uh, came onto the side of the Allies, not as an ally, but as a co belligerent. Somehow there was some kind of military legalistic reason for this. 
Italy was a co-belligerent. It was not an ally. Uh, his wife was Jewish. She spent the entire war hiding in the mountains in Sicily with her young American children as a partner. Wow, that is an extraordinary story. We have to hear more about that at some point. So please email me, Lisa. I'd like to hear more about that story, uh, if you like to share it. Okay. Uh, final questions, comments? Are there any other aspects uh, related to the larger story? Uh, the war des deserve to have redacted his service. Well, uh, 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 oh, that's interesting. Okay, so his war records. Okay, so as you see, uh, it's a kind of complicated story. It's not really like a kind of Hollywood story. Uh, the fate of uh, the Jews of Rome and the Italian Jews is best summed up in Alexander Stile's book, Benevolence and Betrayal, Five Italian Jewish Families Under Fascism. Uh, in that book, the first chapter is devoted to a Jewish family in Torino uh, where the father was a fanatical fascist. Uh, he felt like a lot of other Italian Jews that they had to prove their patriotism uh, in defending fascism that no matter whether it was a constitutional monarchy or a fascist dictatorship, Italian Jews had to quote unquote, quote unquote prove their loyalty to Italy. And some of them like Ettore Avazza became absolutely fanatical fascists, even financing a fascist newspaper in Torino. Uh, tragic story because the Avazza family ended up uh, in an extermination camp. Um, how did most Romans react to the Nazi occupation and the Nazi deportation of the Jews? Uh, this is a kind of historiographical uh, debate. Uh, uh, it had been claimed after the war that most Italians were against the Nazi occupation. Uh, they were against the, the Nazi deportation of Jews to the extermination camps. And it is true, it is true, as I mentioned, that until the Nazi occupation of Italy in September of 1943, uh, nobody had been deported from Italy to the extermination camps. That happened only after the Nazi occupation. And so what happened after the war was that they had developed a myth in Italy called Italiani Brava Genti, which the Italians, like, the Italians were not as bad as the Nazis, right? And so this developed into a very convenient political, uh, uh, social, and even historiographical myth. But as the uh, book that I reviewed last month uh, showed, uh, a lot of Italians actually uh, supported the Nazis and even supported the deportation of Jews. I'll give you a kind of another crazy twist that if it wasn't actually true, you would never believe it. Uh, during the Nazi occupation of Rome, uh, as you know, as everywhere else, uh, the Nazis put a price uh, on the heads of Jews uh, to be turned in by civilians. At one point, the price for a Jewish life was a five kilo bag of salt, okay? And one of the persons who did the most damage in the city of Rome was a woman, a young woman, 20 year old woman by the name of Celeste di Porto, who was nicknamed La Pantera Nera, the Black Panther, because she turned in so many Roman Jews. But the great, great bitter irony is that Celeste di Porto was herself Jewish. I mean, how do you explain something like this? Uh, I'm not sure uh, what kind of psychological damage or perversion must you have to turn in your co-religionists, uh, but that was part of the story of the Roman occupation, uh, of the, the German occupation of Rome. Uh, in Italy, uh, as you know, uh, how many of you have seen this tradition now in European cities of the so-called stumbling blocks? Do you know what these are? These are, uh, sto these are uh, actually brass stones about the size of a small cobblestone that are being inserted uh, in front of uh, the houses of European Jews from where they were deported. You remember that I had said to you, uh, out of those 1,041 Roman Jews who were deported in October of 1943, 15 people returned, 14 men, one woman. Her name was uh, uh, Julia Spizzichino. 
who lost 12 members of her family. Uh, Julia Spizzichino lived until about 15 years ago. When she died, the city of Rome put up a plaque on her house in Rome saying, here lived Julia Spizzichino, deported October 1943, returned to Rome uh, 1945, whenever, died whenever. Uh, a few years ago, that plaque was defaced by a swastika. So who did it? We don't know. But we know that this happened in the city of Rome just a few years ago. Harriet asked, how does Primo Levi fit into the story? That's a whole nother lecture. Levi was a member of the uh, anti-fascist resistance in the city of Torino. He was betrayed by a fascist spy. He ended up first in an internment camp near Molina in central Italy, northern Italy, and then in Auschwitz for a year. And because of a series of uh, lucky coincidences managed to survive. Uh, Auschwitz, as you know, liberated by the Russian army in January of 1945. He makes his way back to Torino and uh, it eventually doesn't happen right away. It takes about 20 years, uh, becomes famous as a Holocaust uh, writer. Uh, and Primo Levi today is considered so, sort of like the Eli Vassell of Italy, the person uh, who every school child is uh, supposed to read uh, as an introduction to understanding what happened in the Holocaust. Even though Primo Levi was very different from Eli Wiesel, uh, Eli Wiesel was uh, a devout uh, uh, Jew uh, studying uh, the Talmud, the Kabbalah, when he was uh, arrested at uh, 15 years of age. Primo Levi was in his early 20s. He was more secular. He was trained as a chemist. Uh, and their attitude their perspective on what happened in the concentration camp is very, very different. Avi Frazier asks, how did I become interested in this topic? I had begun my graduate career studying the Italian anti-fascist resistance, and I began to realize that uh, of the role of Italian Jews, the role that they played in the anti-fascist resistance, then I became interested in the role of Italian Jews in general, and my first book was a biography of an Italian Jewish intellectual born into a very wealthy family, Carlo Rosselli, who, divide, who devoted his entire family patrimony uh, and inheritance uh, to the anti-fascist resistance. Uh, he was one of the first to go to Spain in defense of the Spanish Republic during the Spanish Civil War. He financed an anti-fascist uh, underground newspaper. And in June of 1937, uh, in France with his historian brother, uh, he was assassinated by French fascists who had been paid by Mussolini and the fascist regime. Uh, yeah. Levy was an accomplished chemist who was forced to work in the concentration camp. Yeah, that was one of the things that actually saved him. The, the Nazis were looking for chemists to try to figure out the chemical formula for synthetic rubber and therefore Levy was taken out of the general prison population, the camp population, and worked in a laboratory which offered him some respite from the terrible conditions. And he was also very lucky to survive the various selections. Uh, it's a long story, but he manages to survive. Yeah. Lisa writes that Palermo is a multicultural city with Jewish, Arab, and Christian sites. And yeah, um, so you might be interested to know that in 42, when Ferdinand and Isabel expelled the last Jews and Muslims from the Iberian Peninsula, they also expelled the Jews uh, from Southern Italy, which was under the domain of the Spanish. That included Sicily and Naples. And so what happened was, and Palermo and Naples had been uh, the first uh, globalized cities, the first cosmopolitan, the great cosmopolitan cities of the early modern period. Those Jews actually made their way up the Italian peninsula, sometimes ironically set settling in the papal states. One of them settled, some of them settled in a small mountain town in Calabria called Serra Stretta, where today my friend Rabbi Barbara Aiello, who is the only female rabbi in all of Italy, uh, conducts services in the town synagogue uh, because centuries ago, her ancestor had been a rabbi in that particular town in the mountains of Calabria. So the entire part of Southern Italy has this very rich history 
uh, Jewish history, which is only now in the past 20 years being recovered and recuperated. And these small synagogues are being restored and Jewish communities are, are having a kind of revitalized cultural and, and uh, religious life in places like Naples and Palermo, very important. Thank you all very much. Uh, the circumstances were not ideal, uh, but hopefully next time we can do this in person in the Cultural Center at Hofstra in the fall or next spring. Be well, have a good summer, stay healthy, and thank you everyone.